Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, good morning, Crossroads Church. My name is Marcus. I'm the lead pastor here, and it is a pleasure to come and bring God's word to you. Pastor Joel's out of town. He'll be back in the next couple of weeks or so. But we are in the middle of a series, for those of you who don't know, called a Name Dropper. We're basically dropping since March different names of God that we find in Scripture. Whenever God drops a name, a new name, he's revealing a part of his character and nature. When you understand God's character and nature, it'll encourage and it'll help. Um, it'll stabilize your faith. Because a lot of times you'll face contradictions in life. It's like, wait a minute, that doesn't match who he is. And so you hold fast to God's word. You had hold fast to the character of God because he does, he's not a man that he should lie, right? You can trust him. We might not understand him, but we can trust him even when we don't understand. So this morning, we're looking at a, a, a name that I love. We sing about it. As a matter of fact, we just talked about it right there. Uh, Jehovah Jireh. Uh, Yahweh Yireh uh, is what it's actually called. And what it actually means is Jehovah will see to it and provide. God sees, he'll see to it. You ever hear somebody's like, you're telling them what's going on and stuff, and it's like, oh yeah, I, I, I'll see to that. And it's basically the modern version of, hey, pastor, I got you. I got you, pastor. He goes, yeah, if that guy comes around again, I'll got you. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I got you. Yeah, you got me, babe, right? And so, so, so that's actually what, what, what Jaira is. He goes, Jehovah sees to it, and he makes provision abound towards you. You know, this past week, last week, I told you guys that I was stressed out with all this. Uh, we, we needed some water for, you know, for the admin building in order to get occupancy. And they gave me their bid. And the city said, As, uh, you need a fire hydrant. It's going to cost you $276,000 to get a fire hydrant. I was like, what? It's like, are you crazy or what is happening here? And so I got frustrated all week. It's like, man, Lord, this is not, I'm not going to ask your people for more money. He goes, we've spent almost a year trying to get this free building together. And so, you know, Natalie and I had some intense fellowship. I had to repent several times. And it was just like, oh, it's like, babe, you know what? I am so sorry. I'm stressed out. You're stressed out. And it's, this is not our deal anyways. This is not my place. I didn't want to come here to Seguin in the first place. Because let's just trust in the Lord. So all this time I was stressing out and doing stupid stuff, God was taking care of it. God seeing it, and he was making provision. I got a call. It's like, hey, I want to have a meeting with you Friday morning. So now it's like, hey, we got to go meet, talking about the water stuff. And so these guys got together and had a meeting, unbeknownst to me. And they said, hey, we, we have a proposition for you. He goes, I can't give this free to you because I see the bid, but here's what I can do. I can deduct 200 and something thousand dollars off of this bill. I'm like, what? He goes, and this man told me, he goes, listen, I know this boy. He knows all about this stuff. He knows how to do it. I've worked with his dad. And I told him, I was like, hey, we've made millions of dollars Help my church. He goes, you know, do it. Cut as much cost as you can. So all of a sudden, God made provision. Now we're going to be able to do it. Instead of 270-something thousand, we'll be able to do it for like 80-something thousand, which is a blessing. God saw it. He sees to it. And he makes provision. Now, where are you going to get the 80,000? I'm not sure, but I bet it's right here somewhere. All you need to do is write one check, right? And so that's Jairo. That's Jairo. I identify with George Mueller's comment where he says, my Lord is not limited. He can again supply. And we've seen God's faithfulness in our lives so many years. And this morning, we're going to take a look at Jehovah Jireh and when God dropped that name in Scripture. And it was in the middle of a story with Abraham and Isaac in Genesis, the 22nd chapter. You should have some notes there on your, on your, on your notes there. And um, you can follow us along and, and look at that. But we'll start right here in verse uh, 4 and 5 or 1 of Genesis 22. Um, just go with me here. Now it came to pass. After these things, that God tested Abraham. Have you ever been tested by God? Anybody feel like you're in a test right now? Be ready. You want to get out of it sooner? <clears throat> Abraham said, God said, Abraham, yes, God answered. I'm listening. He said, take your dear son, Isaac, whom you love. Take your son. One translation says, take your son, your only son or your firstborn son. The one that you love, Isaac, which means laughter. And he's like building this case. He goes, and what do I want to want to bless him? No, take him and sacrifice him. I'm like, what in the world is happening here? Whom you love and go to the land of Moriah. Remember that name. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of those mountains that I'll point out to you. 
man, what we see here is something that I call a contradiction. You ever been in a contradicting situation where God is asking you to do something, but it contradicts who he is? And it's a contradiction here in this, in this passage. When I looked at it, man, this is the craziest passage. When I first read it when I was 19, 20, I was like, man, this is not right. Who, who am I serving? It's a moral contradiction. Why? Because isn't God tells us not to murder, but yet he's asking us to sacrifice a child. It was an integrity contradiction because God makes promises and he fulfills a promise. And he said that Isaac would become the promise, you know, of future blessings for generations to come. But yet the one he asked, uh, he promised about, he says, let's slay him. And he took him, taking him out of the equation. It doesn't make sense. It's a major contradiction. Major contradiction with his spouse. Like, how is Abraham going to go and tell his wife that? I know if I was to tell Natalie that, it's like, I'm going to sacrifice your oldest daughter. She'd be like, okay, go. No, I'm just not. She'd be like, no, you ain't doing anything. And so it's a contradiction there. Have you ever been asked by the Lord to follow you into a place that doesn't make sense? Yes. Some of you guys are here in Seguin for that very reason. Like, why am I here? There's a reason for it, right? Marcus, go back home to Seguin in case you forgot and start this church. I understand you don't have a salary. I understand that you don't have a staff. I understand I don't have a location for you. I understand you still need money to pay bills. I understand that you are tired. You think you need a year off before you do anything else. I understand that you, you say in the scripture that a prophet not welcome back in his hometown. Well, I haven't called you to be a prophet. I called you to be a pastor. I understand your weaknesses. I know that you have to pay bills. I know, I know that you need mortgage. I know that you need a utility. And there's no revenue that's going to be coming in. But I want you to start this church and tell people how much you love me and how much he loves them. I'm like, what in the heck is happening here? Marcus, I know every weakness that you have. I know every fear that you have. I know all of your insecurities. I know the, the self-criticism that you, that you walk with. Because you think you can't do this. Well, you can't in and of yourself, but I'm asking you to do something and obey something, and I will empower you to do this. You ever been in that situation when he's asking you to follow him and it doesn't make sense? Oh, by the way, I understand the fears of your previous pastors who were in that role that I'm asking you to be in. One of them dies of a heart attack because of stress. The other one gets divorced because of stress. The other one loses his control of his appetites and has an affair and messes everything up. He goes, I know I'm asking you to do the similar things that, the, that those pastors did. He goes, but I got you. I'll see you to it. I'll make provision abound towards you. And I'm like, listen, I died this again. I buried this again. It's like, I'll never come back to this place. I want to move forward. And then the Lord speaks this to me. And I began to think, like, you know what? I'm running away from God, from what God is running to. God's got something special. God's got something. He has a heartbeat for this city and for this community. And I was running away from him. And God was running towards this. So I had to obey. Here's a, here's a statement. When God wants to reveal his name, he oftentimes leads us to contradicting places. You might find yourself in a contradiction. Places that don't make sense. But there's a reason for it. Isaiah says, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. I love that passage. You obey. It doesn't make sense, but if you obey, you'll see, looking back, it's like, oh, man, it was far better. I can quote like C.S. Lewis, there are far better things ahead, ahead than what we're going to have, that when, what we left behind. And that is so true. There's, I love this city. I love every single one of you. I love what's happening. I love the heartbeat that God has for this community. So it was great, and it was important for us to obey. And Abraham had an opportunity to obey, to go sacrifice his son. Like, who would do that? Abraham would. Verses 3 through 5, it says this. Abraham gets up early in the morning. It's like, wow, man, this guy, either he's a bad kid, and he's like, man, let's take, care, let's take this kid out. Or he got up so early so he could get up before his wife so his wife don't know what is going on. Or he stayed up all night wondering and stressed out about it. But nevertheless, he gets up early, and he saddles his donkey, and he takes two of his young servants and his son Isaac, and he split the wood for the burnt offering. He sets out for a place God had directed him. On the third day, he looks up and he sees people in the distance. Abraham told his two servants, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I are going over there to worship and then we'll come back to you. It's by faith. He goes, hey, listen, stay here. We're going to go over there and worship God and we will both 
return. So this is an audacious, audacious faith that Abraham had. He knew that he would return with his son. Isn't that crazy? Here's my statement. You can still worship and obey God even when you don't understand. Why? By faith. Now, the scripture reveals to us that Abraham's heart in the middle of all that, in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, it says that Abraham reasoned that if Isaac were to be slain, that God would be able to raise him back to life again. That's how audacious his faith was. So he was going to follow through with it, believing that God would still be faithful to his word. So he obeys. Now, verse 6, it says, Abraham <clears throat> took the wood for the burnt offering and gave it to his son Isaac to carry. Where else in scripture do you find a father giving a son some wood to carry to a place on the altar and get sacrificed? Jesus. This whole story is about Jesus. God foresees all this, but nevertheless, let's stick to the story right now. He takes it and gives it to his son. He carries the flint and the knife. The two of them went off together and Isaac said to Abraham, hey dad, yes my son, I see the flint, I see the wood, Where's the sheep for the burnt offering? And Abraham had an opportunity. He's like, mind your own business, son. (laughs) He didn't tell him. He goes, hey, you are the sacrifice. Here's what Abraham did. He says this. Abraham said, son, God will see it. God will see to it that there's a lamb for the burnt offering. And they kept on walking together. Listen, I've raised three children. Three girls, they're 40-something years old now, 38, 9 years old. And here's, here's my statement on that whole deal. Here's a side note. When you, when you can't explain to your children the challenge that God has given you, when you can't explain to them, challenge them to walk by faith with you. So often, I brought my kids in to the thing that God was demanding from me because I wanted them to experience God. And I always felt inside, like, I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on you, God, because now I told my kids... But I just know that we just, we just got to challenge our children's faith because that's when Jesus comes back, he's going to say, Did I, will I find any faith on this earth? Are people still trusting God? I want our children to trust the Lord. I want them to walk with God and trust him that he is faithful to his word. So I remember the girls one day, they thought I was crazy and I probably am, but they were in elementary school and I came home one day because I heard the spirit of God say, we were living in a house that a friend of mine had cut his house in half, and we were living in half of that house. And the Spirit of God, and then we wound up getting a trailer, and, and if you get too far to the edge of the trailer, you'd fall into the ground. It's like, man, Lord, I need a house for these kids. We got out of Bible school. We're doing lawn business and stuff. And I remember the Spirit of God says, I, I'm providing a house for you. And I got so excited. I didn't even ask about the timing or anything. I got home. I was like, hey, God's going to give us a house. Start packing. And I was like, What? Goes, he's going to give us a house, start packing. And that is like, are you crazy? He's like, no, said the Spirit of God told me to start. This is in March. So the kid, they start packing. Just don't pack everything. Pack a lot of everything. So we're, we're just going to get out of here as soon as he tells us. April comes around. May comes around. June comes around. July comes around. I'm like, oh, Jesus. I thought you said we we're going to have a house. And August comes around. September comes around. And I, I had this one house that I really loved. It was available, but we couldn't afford it. I didn't have the money to do it. Called my realtors like, hey, I don't have the money. We don't have the money. So Natalie and I decided, he's like, hey, let's just wait for a year. Let's save. And then we'll go put a down payment. If this house is available, we'll be ready in a better position to get a home. And so we decided to do that. But this thing kept stirring inside of me. So I finally called this realtor. I was like, Joe, says, open up the doors. I want to take my girls after school and take them to this house so they can just see it and get a vision. And so I took the girls, picked them up, (laughs) took them to the house. We went to the bedrooms. Everybody picked their bedrooms. They loved the backyards. Like, man, what am I going to do, Jesus? And so I told Natalie, he's like, hey, after work, Natalie used to clean houses and stuff. Said, come after work, and I want to show you this house. Because I thought we were going to wait till next week. I said, well, we are. Says, but I just want you to see it. So she sits, she comes home into that that house. We're in the living room looking at all the house. Everybody loves it. And she goes, oh, by the way, he goes, "The, the lady that I cleaned for gave me this envelope and told me not to open it until I'm, I'm here with you guys. She has no clue. This lady has no clue what's going on. So we sat there. We opened it. We prayed and asked God for provision. Well, the kids like, Lord, if there's a way you can give us this house, we would love to have this home. 
He opens up the envelope, and there is a check from this lady who barely knew Natalie. says, this is for your house. It's a $5,000 check. And we were just, we just bawled, and we cried. I called my realtor, right? I was like, hey, Joe. He says, I got some money. He goes, what? He goes, I got some money. I want, I want this house. Here's a down payment. I only have $3,000. I wasn't lying. I just told him that's all I had, though. And he goes, because I wanted to save the next 1000 for some furniture and the refrigerator and stuff. So we got in that house on Christmas. Did the Spirit speak? Yes, God sees to it, and he makes provision, even when it doesn't make sense. And I put my life on the line out there. It's like, I thought I was crazy. Now, of course, my wife and my kids thought I was crazy, but it did come to pass. I very, very rarely seldom ever say God said this. Why? Because sometimes I just don't know. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says it this way. It seemed good to me to go here. It seemed good to me to go do that. A lot of times, God's leading is just simply that. It seemed good to me. I call it, pay attention to your seamer. <laughs> pay attention to your seamer. It seemed good to me, and then go. As a matter of fact, I did a timeline of all the major decisions my family and I made, like major moves that we thought the Spirit of God was leading us. Only two of them, two, three of them, was I 100% sure that I knew that God, one of them is this one, uh, coming to this church or starting this church. The other ones I evaluated, when I'm around 60% or so, I go for it. I just go for it. <laughs> that's the kind of crazy pastor that you have. But that's why we do. As a matter of fact, I, when he told us to start this church, I laid out a plan. I already Because I've been doing ministry for 20-something years by that time. I laid out the plan, the outline, the name of the church, Faith Family Church, everything. And after I wrote it all down, he says, you're not doing it that way. Throw that away. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, this is the only way I know how to do this. He goes, how am I going to do this church? He goes, as you go, you will know. I'm like, oh, man, it's one of those trips. <laughs> and you know what? We've been here 17 years, and you can testify. The staff can testify. He's like, as we go, we will know. Last night, I don't know how we're going to get water in that thing. Is everything spilling out? Well, somebody knows. Walmart knows. We'll figure it out. As we know, we will go. And so we obeyed. Abraham obeyed. When we're willing and obedient, we'll eat the good of the land. Amen. In verse 9, it says this. They arrived at the place. <clears throat> they arrived at the place which God had directed. Abraham built an altar there. He lays out the wood. Then he ties up Isaac and lays him on the wood. Abraham reached out to take the knife to kill his son. And just then an angel of God... The only time the angel of the Lord is only used a handful of times in Scripture. The angel of the Lord oftentimes in Scripture is Jesus himself. And the angel of the Lord calls him out of heaven and says, Abraham, Abraham. First time he just said Abraham, one time. Whenever you hear your name being called out twice, get ready. Yeah, I'm listening. Don't lay a hand on that boy. Don't touch him. Now I know how fearlessly you fear God. You don't hesitate to place your son, your dear son, your only son on the altar for me. Now I know how fearlessly you fear God. To fear God is basically to take God seriously. And Abraham took God seriously. Now let me explain something to you. I didn't know how to do this, but basically God has never experienced lack. God has never experienced sin. He's never experienced the things that you and I experience, the trouble, the stress that we go through, you know, making decisions or whatever. But when he sent Jesus and through him, one of the reasons why he came is so that he can sympathize with our weaknesses. Now he understands the trials. Now he understands our tests. He understands our weaknesses and he's touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He knows that about us. Through our experiences, he experiences how we are in places at a crossroads and we're making decisions that honor him and, and, and instead of uh, uh, holding on and holding fast to the, our Isaacs. And so we find ourselves in situations sometimes often by God. He opens doors, he closes doors, and we find ourselves in predicaments like this because he wants to enter in and he wants to understand how committed are you? He wants us to go fully in obedience. You ever been partly obeying? The promise didn't come because he partly obeyed. He came when he fully went in there and fully committed. And he participates with us as we choose him over the stuff. As a matter of fact, our obedience is a reflection of God's love for him. John the 14th chapter says it this way. 
He says, if you love me, those who truly love me are, are those who obey my commands. Whoever passionately loves me will be passionately loved by my Father, and I will passionately love you in return and do what? I'll manifest. I'll reveal myself. How is God going to reveal? However he wants to. However he needs to do it so that you can get that he is a faithful God. So often, think about this statement. So often God will test your love for him by calling for your Isaac. What is an Isaac? Isaac is the thing that you hold on, hold on to affectionately. The thing that it's hard for you to release. Every single one of um, the things that are so important to you will have a tendency to possibly become an idol in your life. Pastor Joel, I was telling him about this message and he shot me a text and I'm just going to show it to you because he preached a really good statement. I said, hey, we're doing this. And he's like, ah, more sacrifice? Why does God keep asking me to let go and surrender things that I want and love? Even stuff that he gave me. His conclusion is he wants to show you that he is your fulfillment of what you need, not the things that he has given you. Isn't that good? I love Joel. He's a pretty smart little guy. He's an amazing brother. I love, you know, I, I've been in a place where I have slain my dad. I've buried my mom. I've buried my sister. I've sacrificed on the altar all of my girls, my wife, my future, my family, my retirement, everything. This world has nothing on me. I went all in when I said yes to him. And every single one of us, those things that are so precious to us, specifically people, he will ask you to lay that down. I love every single one of them and you and this church and this city passionately with everything that I have. I'll do anything and everything to help them get better or stronger. But I don't need them. I don't need any one of them. I love my wife, but I don't need my wife. I need him. I need him. And he is my loyalty. He is my everything. And he's asking us to, to, to do that. And basically, it's like, not my will, but your will be done, God. So I wrote this little thing. It's like letting go of your Isaac means this. He goes, letting go of, your, uh, of the steering. It's not like letting go of a steering wheel. It's not like you're telling him, okay, God, you do the driving. You, Jesus, you take the wheel. Instead of letting go of the steering wheel, he's asking us to let, let go of our steering will, our will. Not your will, but his will be done in our lives. And Abraham, he obeyed only when he obeyed God completely was that name revealed. And when you fulfill your obedience, holy, you'll see him in a different light. Like I said, have you ever raised a half obedient child? I have. I was the half obedient child. And my dad was here in the first service and my dad gave me a new name and a revealed name to me when I was a half obedient child. You know what it was? Grounded. <laughs> he was laughing afterwards. He goes, yep, son. He goes, now do it again. I was like, I'm sure you will. I'm 60 years old almost. He'll do it again. God wants to reveal his name to us. And at the very last verse in 13, here's the conclusion. Abraham, he looks up once he was going to do the sacrifice and follow through. He sees the ram caught by his horns in the thicket. Abraham took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham named the place God, Yireh. God sees to it and provides. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. God sees to it. He sees you. He sees exactly what's going on in your life. And he also makes provision for your life. You know what the secret to your provision is? The secret to your provision is this. God is waiting for us to stop wavering. Abraham, in this passage, when you look at it in the, in the timeline, Abraham was wavering for 40 years before he got this to this place of complete obedience. And a lot of times he's waiting on us. It's not like God, we're waiting on God. It's like oftentimes God's waiting on us. Maybe it's that, I, what is that thing that he's asking you to go? What's that thing that he's prodding you and saying, let that go? And it could be, you know, a person, an individual. It could be a habit. It could be a hang-up. I don't know what it is, but you know what that is. And it's not until you, we completely obey that all of a sudden a name will be revealed of his faithfulness, of his goodness. Don't delay God's provision for your family, for your future, by wavering in your commitment to go all in. 
So here's my take home for you. It's real simple. Number one, don't be a part-time Christian wanting a full-time promise. Go all in. God will see to it. He will see to it. You might think like you're exiting or you're leaving something. You watch how God will multiply it. You watch how God will make provision for your life. Number two, and sacrifice your Isaac. His revealed name as Jireh is worth letting go. When you understand God as your provider, as the one who sees it and goes ahead and makes provision abound toward you, all of a sudden you begin an adventure that you will just be blown away in. He is faithful every single time. And for bonus, this is for all the groups, Scott, if you're here and you're taking notes and you're preparing for the, the small groups, I really want to encourage you to go back home and look at this story, but look at it in the light of Jesus's redemption story. Because when he tells him to go, there's, this is a picture of Jesus, actually. When he tells him to go into the land of Moriah, he goes, on that mountain, I will provide. Well, a little bit later, that land of Moriah became the temple of Jerusalem that Solomon would build. A little bit later when Jesus was on, on this earth, Jesus would walk through that temple and he would say, I am the temple. Destroy this body in three days, I'll raise it back up again. As a matter of fact, Jewish scholars and sages say that that same area in the land of Uriah is where creation took place and where the first Adam was created. It's just a beautiful picture. And when you look at the story, you'll look at where other places do you see a, a son or a father of the faith give wood to a son to carry it to a place of sacrifice. It's Jesus is everywhere. And on that, honestly, when we're in troubled situations, I always go to that mountain. What mountain? The mountain, not of Moriah, but the mountain of redemption. Why? Because when I see Jesus, I see provision for me and for the whole world. It's beautiful. And it's like, oh my God. So I encourage you to go back home and study and look at that passage and look at it in a higher light and a bigger light. And all of a sudden, man, God will just give you rest and peace inside. It's like, I'm faithful. I'll see to it. I'll make provision. Amen. 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 Father, you're so good to us. We are so thankful. I don't know how this lands, Lord God, in people's lives, but I pray that they will have courage to trust you wholly, wholly and follow after you. Help us and grace us to sacrifice our Isaacs in our lives. So we just love you and thank you for that in Jesus' name. Let me just say this in conclusion. Be kind to yourself. Just like, man, you're struggling. I can't really give it all in. It took Abraham 40 years before he got to this place. And you might be struggling, but don't walk out of here condemned. Take your time. Just take the next step. You see, God will show himself faithful in your life. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next. Actually, we'll see you Wednesday. Wednesday nights, for those of you who don't know, we started a Wednesday night uh, worship prayer experience. We're calling it, I forgot, Recharge. Yeah, Recharge. And so that's every Wednesday night from 7 to 8. Our students are here. Bring your kids. And then our, our adults are going to be here worshiping and praying. Love you guys. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.